Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson here with Greg Ettinger, and we are talking today about Nehemiah. We've spent the last couple of weeks talking about the biblical theology, the imagery of walls throughout scripture, what they have represented constantly throughout scripture in different iterations. And today we're going to bring that all to bear on the restoration era. That is when Ezra and Nehemiah and Joshua, the high priest came back and started rebuilding Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. So some things change, Greg, do they not from Solomon's temple to this new restoration temple? Yeah. We've talked about this before, but it never hurts to repeat it. You, you asked me on one occasion to justify my contention that this is a new covenant because it's not usually listed in the um, list of covenant administrations in the Old Testament. Restoration covenant, what's that? But key to God's renewing his covenant is renewing and altering forms of worship. And when Joshua and Zerubbabel will come back and lead the original return and, and set about reestablishing worship. They, they do the altar, which we would expect, and they build the temple, but there's some things missing. The, from our point of view, I suppose, the chief thing is the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. It does not exist, and, and the tables of the law have been lost. We're never told what happened to them. Probably not hidden in some little underground sand pit in Egypt where Indiana Jones can find them. We just, they just <laughs> vanish. Um, but that does raise some interesting questions about worship. How do you do the Yom Kippur ceremony without an ark? Mm -hmm. When the high priest goes within the veil, what does he do with the blood? There's no mercy seat there. <clears throat> There's no mercy seat. We're not told what they did. And yet God orchestrated all of this and told them to rebuild the temple, allowed them, sanctioned it. This was not their imaginings, nor was it simply an attempt to get back the good old days um, the people who who had been expecting the good old days when they saw the foundation slap cried and wept because it was so disappointing. So th there are some things. The Shekinah glory, too, is missing. There's no visible representation, no, no light show of God's presence. Doesn't mean God wasn't present, and that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. But he wasn't, he did not reveal or manifest his presence in the same way he had. So there are some things that have changed. There is still a temple, but no Shekinah glory, no ark, no, no completing the atonement ceremony the way it was supposed to be completed. And, no and fire so that, from heaven to light the ark, no, altar no, either. No fire from, from heaven on the altar. Mm -hmm. Things have changed, and they needed permission. We, we've we looked, I believe, briefly at Zechariah's vision where the angel of the Lord intervenes and says, basically, okay, I've cleansed you. Restart this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they have God's sanction and permission and urging and commandment, but it's not what went on in Solomon's temple, and it's not what, what went on in the tabernacle in the wilderness. So there's something new, and but what we're coming to is there's something even newer. So after a generation or so, during which I believe the events of um, of Esther took place, uh, Jerusalem is again in great distress. As the new the new gates have been burned, the walls, such as they were, such as they had been rebuilt, are down again. And Nehemiah, the king's cupbearer, gets permission to go back and fix them. And um, He's, he's a very thorough, detail-oriented kind of guy. He's got the task maps and the agendas and the, the billing and everything set out. He's, he's got the plan, and he thinks through this, but he, he faces considerable opposition from the Samaritans who resent this upsurge of this old religion that they have. You know, it's the way liberals look at conservatives. Wow, we thought we got rid of you. What are you doing here? <laughs> um, but they're also economically and politically, the, the possibility of Jerusalem regaining its own footing would cast their little Samaria in the shadow. So on a lot of grounds, they don't like this. And they try to oppose Nehemiah, they threaten him, they hire uh, character assassins and, and, and such. But he perseveres through prayer, and, and the book of Nehemiah in part is his prayer journal. Uh, and we see him wrestling to get the job done. And finally... Around chapter 12 or so, the walls are finished and they hold a dedication ceremony. 
Now, this too is something brand new. Uh, when David took the city of Jerusalem, long, long time ago, the city existed already. We're not told exactly how it got there. Presumably, this is the Salem of Melchizedek, but we're not told if he was originally built it or if he inherited it. Um, and, and there's no talk about doing any kind of special rites or ceremonies to sanctify the city. Uh, there was kind of an understanding that the temple sanctified Zion, and and Zion becomes a, sin, a synonym for Jerusalem. So there's a lot of talk in the prophets about the lifting up of Zion in the last days and nations flowing to it, Zion being the city of God. But I, but I think the phrase holy city is only used once before now. And from here on out, it becomes a rather common appellation for Jerusalem because Nehemiah and friends, Ezra and, and the rest, all the priests and Levites get together and they do a dedication ceremony. This is in chapter 12. So it goes kind of like this. This is chapter 12, verse 27. And at the dedication of all of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites out of all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals and psalteries and with harps. And the sons of the singers gathered themselves together, both out of the plain country around about Jerusalem, from the villages of Nitophili, and from the house of where they all came from. Singers, building, priests, and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people and the gates and the wall. Mm -hmm. Then I, Nehemiah, brought up the princes of Judah upon the wall and appointed. Um, two great companies of them, and they gave thanks, uh, whereof one went on the right hand upon the wall toward the dung gate. He, he lists people there, and some of them were carrying trumpets, and then some with musical instruments. They're going with Ezra. Verse 38, the other company of them that gave thanks went over against them, and I after them, and half of the people upon the wall from beyond the tower of the furnace, he's given to the broad wall. And, and so this goes on, verse 40. So stood the two companies, whoops, turn the page here, of them that gave thanks in the house of God. Well, we're, we're, we're on the walls and suddenly we're in the house of God. <clears throat> and that's what's startling. Mm -hmm. There's no, the Shekinah glory isn't present. And yet now the whole city is sanctified. Now, this is ceremonial and ritual. It doesn't mean that all the people were suddenly converted or born again. It doesn't mean that they all live sinless lives. Heaven has not arrived. This is not quite Zechariah's ideal city where holiness to the Lord is written on the very pots and horse bells. But it's typical of that. It points out that this is the direction that the kingdom's moving, that we, we there's the holy place, or the holy of holies, and there's the holy place, and there's the temple, and now the whole city. And it's connected with these walls. These walls delineate a place that is holy. And yet, and, and I suppose this is a good part of what we're talking about, though the city is holy, Gentiles could come. And mm -hmm. God's house is still a house of prayer for all nations. This makes me think, I don't want to jump ahead or short circuit anything, but it makes me think of first Corinthians mm -hmm. where the, the, the church, the believers are the temple of the Holy spirit because the Holy spirit lives in them. When we're said to be the church, mm -hmm. we're, we're not a building. Right. And the church, uh, I mean, of course the, the word is assembly, Right. But right. there is this connotation throughout history of the church being a building, which yeah. is funny, except that it makes sense with scripture. <laughs> so I was like, why is this? Hmm, let's look at the rest of scripture to see why that might be. Yeah. Um, that connection where the people of God are said to be living stones, like in Peter, yeah. and means that we, it is our job to be a dividing line. And at the same time, to have open gates. And at mm -hmm. this point, we might as well just jump to Revelation 21 <laughs> and 22, because that's where this is all going. Uh, you've taken us through a little bit of of, uh, of Paul, and we could go further. We could go to Ephesians uh, chapter 2, where we have the middle wall of partition being broke down, and we are, as you say, we are the temple of God. And then, 
You mentioned Peter. The New Testament epistles are full of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, it started in the Gospels with Jesus pointing at himself and saying, mm -hmm. destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it again. And so Christ is the temple, and yet as his body, the church is the temple, and individual believers are the temple, and yet we're holy stones that together make up the temple. And finally, when we get to Revelation 21 and 22, we see a city, and here, unfortunately, too often people of a very literal mind bent look at that and say, wow, that's a really cool city. I want to walk on streets of gold. Why? <laughs> Ever walk on metal? All day? It's worse than concrete. <laughs> Back for your knees. <laughs> yeah, it's that, and it misses the whole point because right up front, when John sees the heavenly Jerusalem descending, the angel comes and says, "Let me show you the bride, the Lamb's mm -hmm. wife." Jesus is not married to concrete and asphalt and steel <laughs> uh, and glass. He is married to a body of believers, to his elect, to those he died for, to those who will believe on him, have been born again. And and so as we go further into that chapter, we need to realize that we're not talking about a literal city because we've already been told. This is not a city in that sense. It's a city in the original sense. It's a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And it begins using all the language. You, you, I mentioned, you mentioned... Um, that the church is is a temple, we're told in Ephesians 2, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Well, in Revelation 21, we see that this city is built upon foundations that have the names of the apostles of the Lamb in it. Hmm. This, he's quoting Ephesians. <laughs> and Ephesians is talking about the church, just as he is. And and so as, as we stand back and look at this thing, it's a huge city, if it were literal, Um the one from one corner to the other would be the distance from Dallas to New York. Hmm. And the height would um, leave Everest far behind, hmm. uh, would brush, brush the, the lower regions of, of space. Um, but that's not the point. The point is, this is an incredibly huge city because God has an incredible number of people. We saw them earlier in Revelation. A great multitude which no man could number of every kindred, nation, people, and tongue. And so when we get to the end of the book and we see the final thing laid out in front of us, the city does have walls. We were talking about this before we started our broadcast. The city has walls, but it also has open gates. That seems counterproductive. And if, <laughs> if you're you've thinking, got walls, why open the gates? <laughs> yeah. It's, if, you're, if you're thinking in literal terms, what, what's that all about? Uh, and we are we are told that there are those who were without, but the things the people who are without are not, as you suggested, they're not ter extraterrestrials. <laughs> they're not from other countries. They're not other races or other ethnic groups. Um, in fact, let me read who these people are who are outside the city. For without, because we've already established that those that make up the city are from every kindred, tribe, and tongue. Right. But without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. In other words, the boundaries are ethical. Mm -hmm. To be in the city is to be holy. To be outside the city is to be unholy. And yet the gates are open and there are angels. I remember at the Garden of Eden, there were cherubim that guarded the throne, guarded the tree of life. Here, there are angels who are inviting people in. So the coming of Christ into the world has changed things. It does not change the fact that God requires holiness. God simply has supplied holiness in the person of his son. And the invitation and the, the gates of the city face all four compass points, three gates on each side. And these angels are calling people to come. And more than that, we're told, um, the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that heareth say, come and let him that is the thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. And, and, and so with the waters of life rushing out of the city, and the angels and the church and the spirit inviting people into the city, yes, there are walls, there are boundaries, but they're ethical boundaries. They're questions of holiness, but that's a holiness that ultimately supplied, not only ultimately, initially, and, and most fundamentally supplied by God himself in Christ. So... Here is God's long-term solution. Now, what Nehemiah did foreshadowed this on a very small level, 
Um, the holy the city became the holy city, and yet Gentiles could still come in. But the sanctifying of the walls and the gates didn't make the people holy. You know, just pointed forward to in in picture form to what God's after, which is what we see here. We see the church in all of its glory as God sees her as she will be in time and eternity. Um, and while time lasts, there's still this invitation: come, mm -hmm. be part of this. Yeah. This really creates some cognitive dissonance for uh, for me with my my background growing up dispensational, where mm. all of Revelation is supposed to be at the end of time when it's final. Yeah, right. If if this is the final time, there's no point to the angels going out and say come, because yeah. the, the final judgment is final. Like we've <laughs> it's in the name, <laughs> right? So it's not like those in hell are they don't have more opportunity no, to repent. No, they don't. Uh, in the tail end of uh, chapter 21, there's this. Well, let me, actually, let me read. Um, the 12 gates were 12 pearls, which, by the way, first of all, that would be really giant pearls and one <laughs> yeah. mega oyster going on here. Yeah, where's that oyster? <laughs> it's a, it's a, one of those crypto, cryptozoology yeah, things. Yeah, that would be, and... Um, but they are pearls, and pearls in general were not counted that big a deal, but they come from the ocean. They come from the Gentile mm. Sea. Mm -hmm. um, and every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. And then skipping down a little bit. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then he goes on in chapter 22 and talks about the, the water of river of the water of life that's pouring out of the city. So the, the city is pure. It, it, is, it consists of those who have been justified and sanctified by faith, who are holy in Christ. That which is impure has no part there. Uh, and yet the na here are the nations bringing their glory and honor into it. This is still a time of redemptive history still going on here. Now, mm -hmm. it climaxes when all of this is brought to utter fullness, but you know, as you say, when we finally get to everything settled and final, then the gates are closed. There is, There will be a day when the trumpet will sound, and where you are is where you are. Mm -hmm. And there's no more repentance. There's no more salvation. The last soul was saved, and God calls time, and there's a final judgment, and final means final. And in that day, you will, be on, you will either be in the city or out of the city. But as long as it is called today, as the psalmist and the writer of mm -hmm. Hebrews say, the invitation is there. Enter into God's rest. Come into the city. Belong to God's people. And it is, salvation does involve belonging to God's people. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're back to this, a city's a community. You, God, uh, after the day of Pentecost, added daily to the church such as should be saved. It's none of this just me and Jesus and... All I can think of is impolite words at this point, but the attitude that some people have toward the church of, I don't need you, because mm -hmm. um, it's just me and Jesus. And I can go to church if I want to, the same way a philatelist goes to a stamp collecting club if he wants to, but doesn't really have to, because you know he's a stamp collector in his own right. There's none of that here. God in saving us, is saving us into and as a part of and to become one with this community, which is eternal. And as we, as we look at this thing, we have to keep rem reminding ourselves that the borders are ethical. Will you keep the commandments of God? Have you been declared righteous in Christ? It's not a question of what color your skin is, or what shape your eyes are, or where you were born, or what language was your first one. None of that's relevant to this. And unfortunately, there are still some Christians who look at these things as if they were determinative. And it can happen on both sides of the aisle, as it were. You know, where you people are so racist, we will therefore write you all off because, <laughs> wait, come on, let's. Someone has to be the first to smile, the first to give, the first to reach out a hand and say, 
Yeah, you guys are acting awfully racist, but we love you. Come on over, or we'll come to you if you'll let us. Let's break down some of these walls that we've invented, because God sure enough didn't invent them. Uh, it, it's natural enough to want to hang out with people you have a lot in common with, and there's nothing wrong with that as such. But when you start saying, and they can't really be real Christians, because real Christians have my skin color and speak my language and live in the good old U.S. of A. <laughs> no, that's that's not Christianity. Christianity is universal and calls to the whole world, and that city will be filled. Filled. Mm -hmm. The city that's great immensely multitude. huge. With a great <laughs> multitude that we can't even count. Won't have to take a census anymore. How many people <laughs> live here? More than you possibly can count, <laughs> even if you can count really high. So there's... There's the ultimate vision. This is what the, the walls fall as far as everything else is concerned, except the holiness of God. And we have that in Christ, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. Uh, this is the gospel. This might be a little bit of a tangent, but gold. We, we haven't done a biblical theology of gold, <laughs> but it would be really interesting to do that because... You know, there are things about gold that are obvious that it's very valuable and precious. Mm -hmm. um, it's very shiny. Mm -hmm. And I think there's there's kind of been this trend lately to use precious metals for their antimicrobial properties, <laughs> which okay. is weird to me. Like, I don't... You mean like colloidal silver or what are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Pe people sewing silver and gold into clothes and things and pillowcases and whatnot. Really? I don't know yeah. any of this. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a strange little thing that the internet and our vast wealth has made possible, <laughs> I suppose. But... Well, they're I also think, very good for conducting electricity as far as yeah. that goes, stamping yeah. out microchips. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the um, you know, it kind of adds more to, you know, the king's cup being made of gold. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's the right choice. Like it's, it's healthier to drink from a gold vessel than from a wooden one, you know? And I don't know that there's something there that I don't know, maybe hints at the concept of clean versus unclean. I don't know. The first time we run into gold is in, of course, Genesis. Mm. And the land of Ophir. <laughs> yeah. The, the land, um, the, the gold of that land is good or pure, unmixed. Mm -hmm. But that was downstream. It wasn't in the garden itself. Mm -hmm. And and yet Adam and Eve somehow are told that it's out there. So from the beginning, it, gold is held up as a good thing. We have, there is the question, well, why? You can't eat gold. <laughs> um, and uh, electric circuits are a long way off and copper is cheaper to use anyway. Uh, God obviously has established some connection in our hearts and minds between gold and what we think of it representing. Kings m migrate to gold, and they have <laughs> gold migrate to them. They want gold. The ancient world, as you say, the cups, the crowns, the scepters, everything's made of gold. For one thing, it is rare, but there's a lot of things that are rare that we really don't <laughs> care about. <laughs> yeah. Um, you said, I think that it's sparkly. It is. It is sparkly and it is durable and it is uncommon. And there is just something about it that reminds us of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. So that when we get to the tabernacle, God wants lots and lots of stuff made of gold. Everything in the Holy of Holies is gold. Most of what's in the holy place is gold. By the time you go out into the outer court, we're shifting toward bronze and brass and wood, um, which suggests that, that God is reinforcing this, that, that gold is reflecting um, something of who he is. Why should that, should that be? Because God made it that way. I mean, why <laughs> is the sky blue? Well, you see, it's because lights refract it. No, no, no. Why did God choose to make the sky blue? Yeah. What's the point there? <laughs> You're talking about how the sky is blue. We're talking about why the sky is blue. <laughs> yeah. Why did God do this? Mm -hmm. Why does he describe heaven as up? Mm -hmm. um, as far as we can see, using modern sci-fi terminology, it's, <laughs> it's a different dimension. And yet people seem to get there by going up. 
is it really far away or is it really close or is the the dimensional no. portal just really <laughs> near? Yeah. Um, there's there's a lot there that we don't know, and yet God deliberately chose these kind of images and words, and and wove them into our experience. Uh, when we think of something great and wonderful, we think of as high as heaven. Mm-hmm. And that which is depressing and debasing is as low as the pit. Mm-hmm. Uh, even directions mean something to us. Up and down mean something to us. Blue and red mean something. Put them together, you get purple. That means something. And gold means something. And and God has has built that into us so that by the time we get to the book of Revelation, the street is gold, the city is gold, there's gold all over the place. Now, as I said earlier, practically, that that's not what it sounds like. You know, you, you can think of some some hick or redneck or someone from well, where I grew up, uh, walking into a golden city and saying, Wow, this is incredible. But honestly, after a day of walking on metal streets, you're gonna want parkland. <laughs> and and actually, the although the streets are gold, the rest of the city seems to largely be um, orchards of tree of life. We're not told where the buildings are. Well, the, it's because this is an image. The the, the people are the city. Mm-hmm. You you mentioned before the people are the living stones that make up the city. And, Which and, and you so, know further implies that no matter what purpose your particular stone mm-hmm. is doing, whether you're the the thing that people walk all over, mm-hmm. or you're the one holding up the walls, yeah. you're still made of gold. Yeah. Yeah. That's God's evaluation of his people, because that's who we are in Christ. Not what we merit, but what he makes us in his son. And and so there's something of the significance of gold. And then that helps to explain some little economic things like, why does a gold-based currency work so much better than <laughs> yeah. other things? Well, there that's why. It's not mm-hmm. because gold is intrinsically valuable. The only thing that's intrinsically valuable is God himself, or and mm-hmm. his word, I suppose, if you his word taken as his word, not as, you know, a copy magic of the Bible. Words. <laughs> you know, or magic words. Um but uh God God wrote this into us, and so we, by nature, gravitate toward using gold rather than all the other things in the world that are scarce, but that no one cares about. Um, and as I said, you can't eat gold. What can you do with it? Give it to your true love in a ring or a hairpin mm-hmm. or a necklace. Uh, or a nose seem, ring, even. Or a nose ring. We seem <laughs> to have, we seem to have passed the day when civil rulers are adorned with it. I did not see King Charles' coronation. I still mourn Elizabeth's passing. Um, for me, her coronation will always be the last one in British history. But that's just me. <laughs> um, you know, and she's given the gold orb with the cross on top, and it's told, "Know that the whole world is subject to the dominion of Christ." That's fitting. I don't think we want to give a gold hat to the president of the United States no. or a gold wig to the Supreme Court justices. We, we've, we've passed by that and we've put gold where it belongs. Um, well, no, we haven't. We've lost gold. But we were putting it where it belonged <laughs> yeah. for 100, 200 years, which is circulating around in people's hands, getting dirty, grimy, and messy. Being, <laughs> think being of the... A, uh, Hello, Dolly line. Money should be flowing like manure out, yeah. making young things grow. <laughs> there you go. Um, because now that we have the reality in Christ, it's not as important, and yet it still has its practical uses because so God has make, not removed that. Does this make Bitcoin the Gnostic currency? I suspect. I, I am I am suspicious of it because it... it, it it recognizes this, that humans do impute value mm-hmm. to particular objects, often by free choice. When I was a kid, pet rocks were a thing. <laughs> and our little um, five and dime um, sold pet rocks for like a season. And then they were gone forever. Because people suddenly realized wait, I can make one of those if I wanted to, at which point they realized, and why would I want to? And that was that. <laughs> but for a little while, people said, these things are valuable, and I has to have one. 
Um, Garbage Pail Kids. What was that all about? But people- What? Garbage Garbage Pail Kids? Do you remember Cabbage Patch Kids? Yeah, I remember Cabbage Patch. Yeah, Garbage Pail was the next step down. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was- (laughs) And for a season, everybody, you know, when Christmas, dads are falling all over themselves to get the last one available in the store. And then they went away. Um, We do, for brief times, impute value to things that have no functional use, no ornamental value to speak of, or at least one that can easily be supplanted by something else. We do that. And that's all right. And if you can make something that everyone wants to buy for a little while, that's great. Go for it. But to assume that that's going to sustain itself over decades and even centuries is incredibly naive. Mm -hmm. Gold is um, is not a historic currency because people keep on rediscovering how pretty it is. It's because of something that God has put into us, and it will always be there to some extent, probably not to the extent that it was before Christ came, but it's 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 going to be there. And the whole thing with Bitcoin, as far as I can see, is one big assumption that this will be valuable because people think it's valuable, which is true as long as they think it's valuable. <laughs> And when they stop thinking it, it will be absolutely worthless. So (laughs) it becomes a game of how far can I keep my hand in the game before I get out and everything collapses? It it sounds a lot, honestly, like the days just before the Great Depression. Hmm. Can can I pull the money out of the bank, out of the stock market, just before everyone else does to make a killing? Or if I'm Hmm. one day late, I lose everything. So So it's just another fiat currency. Yeah, it's just another fiat currency. This one isn't imposed by the state. Yeah, there are supposedly gold-backed cryptocurrencies, which still feels Gnostic to me. I don't know. (laughs) I don't understand. David could probably tell us. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. (laughs) Anyway, so there's a biblical theology of gold for you to go with the city theme. Uh, the, The Garden of Eden didn't have gold, but it had access leading to it. The tabernacle had gold. Solomon's temple had lots of gold. Mm-hmm. Nehemiah's temple, not so much. Nor did it have the Shekinah glory in a visible sense, and yet the holiness is spreading, which is a key that holiness is an ethical matter, not a matter of how pretty you are on the outside. Mm-hmm. And when we come to the New Jerusalem, we're shown gold again, but again, where to understand. In fact, some of the things you said that no matter who you are, what you are, what your function is in God's kingdom, you are, in God's eyes, gold. Mm. Just like his word, just like Christ himself. Well, that's a good place to wrap up. Uh, we should have some recommendations. My ma- recommendation is making cookies. I like mm-hmm. that recommendation. What yeah. kind of cookies should you make? I made a chewy chocolate ginger molasses cookies. <laughs> uh, they're basically ginger snaps, but with a little bit more molasses gooeyness and chocolate uh-huh. chips. Oh, we put chocolate chips in. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. I, 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 I could get into that. Mm-hmm. My recommendation, it, it, will, it would be more of a recommendation after today, but <laughs> it's taking your wife out uh, on... Uh, a trip to go book shopping and have a picnic lunch with your favorite food items from Trader Joe's and afterwards ending up in a best Italian restaurant in town and having tiramisu. In That's other words, amazing. <laughs> break the routine and do something fun together. And I will freely confess, as I did to Emily earlier, that I just thought it sounded like fun. And my wife said, oh, that's so romantic. I said, it is. <laughs> oh, right, dear. Yeah. Yeah, it's romantic. It's romantic. That's why I planned okay. it. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we're, since we're done here and she gets home. We're going to be off. I was I was looking up. Uh, it's amazing how many bookstores there are in Grass Valley. Oh, being you're coming small, up my my neck of the woods. Yeah, being such a small place, there seem to be more bookstores than there are in like most of Sacramento put together. <laughs> uh, I did find one that had nothing but bad reviews. <laughs> okay, we maybe won't go to that one, but anyway, it should be fun. Then we'll we'll look for some place to have our our little um, snack lunch from. Trader Joe's. We have special cheeses and nuts mm. and such. So you know what I really like from Trader Joe's is the Green Goddess cheese, and they don't have it all the time. I look for it every time, and it's kind of occasional. I don't know if they just stopped doing it. My favorite is Cotswold cheddar. 
which mm. they did not have this time. I was very upset because I haven't bought it in a while. It's not probably not good for my gout. But I thought, <laughs> oh, I'll, we'll splurge. No, it wasn't even there. So we got a couple other kinds. And if they turn out to be any good, I'll let you know. I don't remember what they are. But they they looked like they had the same spirit as Cotswold. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Spiritually similar. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> so. Well, great. I hope you have a great time. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad we got to go on that little tangent about gold. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you buying us the software that makes it possible to get this podcast out to you. Listener, if you would like to join our financial supporters, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. If you'd like to get transcripts of our shows, you can subscribe to our sub stack halting towards Zion. I, I should clarify once in a while that it's toward without an S because we're Americans. <laughs> we but are. When'd that happen? We, yeah, I feel like, mm, you know, we, we like England a lot, but I feel like we wouldn't fit in there. <laughs> Yeah, we actually believe that. in self-defense and things like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you can send us an email at haltingtowardsion at gmail.com. Send us your recommendations, thoughts, questions, insults, anything. We'll take it. I won't read the insults. David will read them and uh, translate mm. to me in kind words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Hope you'll join us next time.